this is Dr. Vanuth Bikdeli from Columbia University Irving Medical Center, Yale Center for Outcomes Research and Evaluation and Cardiovascular Research Foundation in New York. In this issue of Clot Chronicle, I wanted to discuss a little bit of, with you about the considerations from prevention and management of thrombotic disease in the face of COVID-19 pandemic. I think of it as a few big buckets. One of them is how do we provide optimal care prevent, or if they occur, try to treat patients uh, with COVID-19 who suffer from thrombotic events. That's one. And then also, how do we manage to use the technology and tools in the best way possible to be able to provide optimal care to patients who do have thrombotic disease from the past, but need to adhere to social distancing measures, but still need optimal care during this pandemic? And also, how do we optimally use the resources from different societies and funders, et cetera, to be able to foster more knowledge generation. So to start off, um, I think among patients with COVID-19, we can think of the disease in different categories of severity. The most important one, obviously, is people with moderate to severe disease. And recently, we coalesced an international collaborative of investigators and clinicians to try to help address some of the unmet needs in this area. I think at this point, it's reasonable to consider that for patients with moderate to severe COVID-19 who get hospitalized, risk stratification for prevention of venous thrombosis is very critical. And for people who are deemed to be high risk, as long as there are no contraindications, use of pharmacological prophylaxis is one of the important things to consider. Now, an uncertain area for future investigation is what is the optimal dose of prophylaxis. That's, I think, for the moment open to be answered in future prospective studies. But within our panel, the majority recommended the guideline-directed prophylactic dosing. We also see a lot of hemostatic derangements in patients with COVID-19. That's part of the reason we think they're very much predisposed to thrombotic events. In terms of how to optimally track that and manage that, I think key is to have a high index of suspicion and do appropriate testing But as of now, our panel did not recommend routine screening, including with bilateral ultrasound in the absence of clinical suspicion. Aside from the end patients, I think another area that is very critical to discuss is what do we do when patients with COVID-19 past the period of hospitalization are about to get discharged? Now, we know from some other randomized controlled trials in acutely ill medical patients that use of extended pharmacological prophylaxis might be a successful strategy to reduce the risk of thrombotic events. Obviously, that comes at the risk of excess bleeding. So I think at this point, it's also very reasonable to weigh the risks and benefits of extended pharmacological prophylaxis at the time of hospital discharge and use prophylaxis in select cases wherein we think the risk of VTE exceeds the risk of bleeding. Similarly, some of the patients might just have mild COVID-19, but during the periods of social distancing, they might just get isolated and they might be practically homebound or even bedbound, which also dramatically increases the risk of VTE. Even though there is no direct data in that field, I think it's fair to extrapolate from other studies. And our panel was thinking in a case-by-case basis, even in select patients, in that proportion of people, it might be reasonable to consider BT prophylaxis. The last part that I wanted to touch upon with respect to patients would be people who do have known thrombotic disease but no COVID-19. How do we provide optimal care to them? First, just to demystify some confusion that is existing on the web, there is no evidence to date, to the best of my knowledge, that use of antithrombotic agents confers any risk for afflicting the disease or having severe COVID-19. Rather, it's probably the underlying risk factors and precedent cardiovascular disease that might confer some risk. And the last piece in this section would be, how do we manage people who take vitamin K antagonists? Obviously, if their international normalized ratio is well controlled, that would be less of a challenge. But for people who have labile INR, and in case that there is no contraindication, a reasonable alternative, I think, could be to try to either use drive-through INR machines or home INR, if neither of the two are possible, last alternative would be to consider direct oral anticoagulants as long as there is no contraindication and the patient population fits 
the existing randomized trial data to support its use, and also the patients are able to afford the medication. So those are the points that I wanted to outline for patients, but also there are a couple of important considerations for societies and also for funders. I think now is a time of collaboration, so professional societies should try to coalesce the efforts to try to generate more knowledge, but also to disseminate the knowledge. And as far as funders are concerned also, I think we have so many much needed areas of knowledge gap where the funders could be very helpful in terms of helping to promote knowledge generation, as has been occurring recently with the American Heart Association, National Institute of Health, and others. Thank you very much for your attention. <music>